my daughter is what you're telling me below the parking garage. And give us some kind of idea of what's going on under there. Please, no. please, I'm begging you. We can't have things stop the search for the loved ones or repair. We have a total of 24 that we removed from the debris and 21 have been identified. So 24. Did you check all the cars that uh, there is no victim? Any, any, any of the cars. I right, so promise to be honest with you, and we're being honest with you now, and we are trying. But the reality is that the spaces that we were hoping were there just have not been there. Have we found any uh, any alive victims so far? No. no. What we're finding is again uh, human remains. That's why when you guys. Yeah, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. I'm we just, don't care. We want the yeah, update. Want You're the relevant. Update. Excuse me. I'm just going to speak briefly to let you know. That How many pieces do you find? Man, I, I'd rather not answer that question. Um, it, just out of emotionally, I prefer not to answer that question. For the first time since search and recovery efforts ended in July, Assistant Fire Chief Ray Jadala and Firefighter Maggie Castro returned to the Seaview Hotel. It was here for the better part of a month where they provided twice daily briefings to the friends and families of those missing in the Champlain Towers collapse. It's strange to see it. There are no people, no rumbling of voices, no... No crying, no... No crying, no yelling. I can still hear like, you know, different people's voices in my head and the things that they would say when they would come up and talk to us. Inside this room, pressure mounted with each passing day as families talked nervously amongst themselves. When Maggie and I would walk in, all of a sudden it would almost go silent because it's like, oh my God, they're here. What are they gonna provide us with today? Every emotion you can think of took place in this room. Together, they promised the families they would share everything with them no matter how difficult. And we've always promised to be honest with you, and we're being honest with you now, and we are trying. But the reality is that the spaces that we were hoping were there just have not been there. At times, the room felt like it would descend into chaos amid all the anger. You guys are so focused on these laws and rules, and you're scared to bend them. I understand. You don't understand. I do understand in regards to Listen, it's not just your your family, it's everyone's family, okay? I I'm, and I'm aware. Folks, 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 this way. Look at me, look at me, folks. There's no script for this. That's why it made it so difficult, so different. And even if there was a script, you wouldn't be able to follow it. No, you can't so, script yeah. what you're going to say yeah, to someone. you can't. Because you don't know what that person's going to be feeling that day. Yeah. I knew that initially this was a room, I think also another way to describe it, of strangers. None of us knew one another. At the end of the three weeks, we pretty much knew everybody's name. Yeah. They definitely knew ours. There were a lot of hard conversations held in this room. And it just got more and more difficult as time went on. Were there days where you just did not want to walk in here? Oh, sure. Not because I didn't want to see everybody, you know, and not because it's just because you don't have answers yet. You know, dealing with the desperation of the families, um, the hope, and watching hope dwindle away. It was just day after day, hoping for good news and, you know, coming to grips with the inevitable that was going to come. For the family and friends of the missing, it was no different. When I come in here, I don't expect good news. I only expect to hear bad things. So it, I need a minute to sort of like breathe because for what I feel when I walked in, perhaps maybe I'm not going to hear something good. And that's not the case. I'm not here for that today. But that's the feeling that came back to me when I walked in. But in a way, we didn't dread coming here. We came here and we were comforted in a way. There wasn't, there was darkness everywhere at that point, but when we walked into this room, it didn't feel like doom. We felt like, okay, we always had the hope. So when we walked in, it was more like, what are we gonna hear today? And hopefully it'll be good news. The last time I was in this room was during the time where my mom was missing. I mean, this is the room where it happened. This is the room where everyone was at their worst, including me and my family. 
This is where there were a lot of tears in this room, um, a lot of heartbreak, you know, a lot of devastation. It would take a month for all 98 victims of the Surfside collapse to be found. But over those weeks, hundreds of strangers came together, united in the worst way imaginable. Because Ray also told us throughout the entire process, lean on each other. And we were. We all really did lean on each other. You guys have something in common. You're tragically bonded. Thursday, June 24th, 1.15 a.m. The Champlain Towers South began to buckle. As the building shifted, pipes in the underground garage burst. Startled by the sudden rumbling, Cassie Stratton called her husband, Mike, who was in Washington on business. The shaking woke her up. Cassie was in Unit 410 on the south end of the building, overlooking the pool and the entrance to the underground garage. And she told me that the building was shaking and she thought it was an earthquake and then uh, she went to explore and she saw that there was this uh, large uh, sinkhole that was forming out in the plaza. From the window of her balcony, Cassie couldn't appreciate the severity of the problem. And she saw that water was flowing from the sinkhole into the garage, which is underneath the plaza and the buildings. Then all of a sudden as she was describing the sinkhole and she said, oh my God, the building is shaking again. And she screamed. And that was it. The line went dead, and in less than 20 seconds, the building caved in on itself. Captain, hey, we, uh, the Champlain Towers, the building, it collapsed. The building is gone. There's no elevators. It almost resembles the trade center. People on the balcony shouting that they are trapped inside of their apartment. Right. Right. Oh, hold on, hold on. Right. Right. Nobody right. can get in there. Right. Right. Nobody can get in there. Right. Nobody can get in there. Jadala was home when he got the call from one of his chiefs. You just can't comprehend it, you know, on TV or by pictures until you physically get to the site and realize this is just not good. Jadala has been with the department 21 years and was a member of the urban search and rescue team that has traveled around the world following disasters. With Jadala racing to the scene, firefighters went to work rescuing residents trapped in the portion of the building which had yet to collapse. On the pile, 15-year-old Jonah Handler was pulled from the rubble along with his mother, Stacy Fang. The teen survived. His mother did not. By morning, a smoky haze filled the air as fires burned out of control. When families, desperate for answers, showed up at the collapse site, they were told the area wasn't safe and were sent instead to the town's community center, where local officials struggled to give them answers. Are your people still trapped? Are the people still trapped? Do you have any names? We don't know. Frustration mounted when some in the crowd report seeing no firefighters on top of the rubble. There's not one person there. It's bullshit. It's so good. We just heard from our fire chief that teams are searching under the rubble. You can't see them on the top because they are under the rubble. On the beach side of the community center, Rachel Spiegel stood alongside her father and brothers, all still in shock that their mother, Judy, was missing. When we went to sleep last night, we would have never imagined that this is what we would be waking up to. And we're heartbroken, and I just want my mom to know how much we love her. And we're, we're here. We're not going anywhere. We are not giving up hope. Accompanied by a network crew from CBS News, they decide to walk together to the collapse site so their father can see it for the first time. This is not going to be pretty. It's worse in person. Yeah. Then it is in the videos, okay? Dad, do you see it? No, I don't see it. Yeah, you see it? Oh my God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's okay. She's okay. Oh. I want my mommy. She's gonna be okay. She's up. She's there. We gotta get her out. 
But how come no one's doing anything? They're underneath. They can't because they're scared the rest of the building is going to collapse. By that first night, the county sets up a formal briefing area for the families, moving from the community center to the Grand Beach Hotel. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming in. All right, so in regards to a recap of uh, what's occurred since uh, this morning. Jadala gave himself the unenviable task of working with the families. When did you realize that you were going to be the point person with the families? The, the, day, the day that I met the families. So I recognized that uh, you know, these family members you know, hadn't been given information. Jadala promised the families he would be completely honest with them, no matter how bad the news might be. Uh, we had to suspend many of the operations as a result of the uh, fire that was uh, burning uh, underneath. Trust was in short supply. The initial images of there being no firefighters working on top of the pile created doubts about Miami-Dade being up for the job. I know that uh, there was a request for the uh, Israeli um, search team. Um, uh, matter of fact, <coughs> coincidentally, uh, Mayor Levine Kava had already spoke to the consulate from Israel, and the team was already en route. So the request in regards to the Israeli uh, team has uh, been fulfilled. Thank you. Yeah. Inside the room, another grim task was underway. Families were asked to provide DNA samples in the event their loved ones need to be identified. That responsibility landed on Stephanie Stoiloff, the commander of the Miami-Dade Police Department's Forensics Bureau. Transparency was important, right? Correct. Being honest with them, even brutally honest. Mm hmm Yes. When families asked, why don't they ask for dental records? Why can't we provide dental records? We never told them they couldn't provide dental records. The day I had to explain that not everybody had um, something to compare to was another one of those days where you see that settle into the, the consciousness of the room, you know, and they're um, even following with, well, what about teeth? You know, can't you use teeth? But not everyone has teeth. With a master's in biology, her work typically is in the lab and not dealing with crime victims or their families. Commander Stephanie Stoyloff, Forensic Services Bureau, Miami Dade Police Department. But like Jadala, she gave herself this assignment. One of the first days, um, a father came up to me with a picture to tell me about something about his son. And I said, let's go to, um, let's go make sure we get this because we might need it for identification. And we actually identified him later that day. Lisa Shrem and Rachel Sabog flew to Miami after the collapse because their friend, Estelle Hedea, was missing. She lived in Unit 604 on the north side of the building. Tell me a little bit about Estelle. Estelle was great. It's, hard, it's still hard for me to talk about her in the past tense. She was the life of the party. She was always happy, always positive. I got you. I got you. Look, I'm a single woman. Um, I don't want to speak for Rachel, but she is too. Estelle was. And it's, uh, it's sort of like a, a woman code. You know, you don't leave anyone behind. And it was a vow that we made a long time ago to each other. And I was about honoring the vow to be here for her until the very end. 48 hours after the collapse and the briefings are more structured. They take place twice a day at 9.30 and 5.30 and they always begin with the one question on everyone's mind. Everyone wanted to hear the numbers. And I think, and at least for myself, I was really looking for them to find somebody alive. Judy Spiegel lived next door to Estelle in Unit 603. Obviously, I was holding out hope that it would be my mom, who is so important to me, and that, you know, I really can't even fathom that this is my reality right now, but even if it was anybody, I think that everyone would have celebrated because that would have inspired hope in everybody. During the, uh, the process of the search and rescue, uh, we did find uh, four additional victims, and uh, we did find, in addition to the four additional victims, again, we did find human remains. As Jadala speaks, members of the search and rescue team from Israel file into the room, 
led by Deputy Commander Colonel Elad Edry. Good morning, everyone. My name is Elad Edry. I'm the deputy of the Israeli delegation, and we came here uh, to help you and to support you. 300 people inside, and um, all of them were crying, and you actually could sense in the air the sorrow, the, the grief. Some family members shouted questions to the Israelis, asking whether the Miami-Dade team was doing enough. When you hear from them, that's what they'll tell you. They'll tell you they've come to offer relief to our officers that they know are world class that work together. Okay, let's let's continue. Folks, listen. Again, we let's. I I, I understand the emotions, but let's uh, let's get the uh, questions answered. So let's just stick to the. DNA. Families notice the Israelis start to leave. In regards, remember I had mentioned that we continue to hear sounds, and I can't emphasize enough. It's not voices, okay? It, it could be a tap, it could be a scratch, it could be the metal contorting underneath the, uh, the rubble. It's not, you know, anybody uh, yelling or anything like that. We haven't heard any voices uh, since uh, the time. Why are they taking IDF out? There's going to be a lot of questions for them. They just arrived at the site. They're heading back, they're heading back to the site. They're going back to work. They'll be back Maybe they should answer the questions because there's a lot of questions. Amid rising tension, Police Director Freddie Ramirez grabbed the microphone. We know you're hurting. We're hurting as well. We're standing here with you. We're a family right now. This tragedy has put us together. Please understand that. We have to get through this together. And we knew that every time we came in this room, in the morning and in the afternoon, we had to be as transparent as possible, as focused as possible, uh, in tune with their feelings and what they were going through, and our own feelings as well. A few minutes later, the Israelis were hustled back into the room. You have very good men and women out there to count on them, and they have the best equipment there is in the world of rescue. We came to assist the forces, the local forces. We didn't come to replace them. Do you feel like you would have done anything differently? Oh the answer is uh, simple. From my point of view, the forces, the equipment, the techniques that are used and that are um, demonstrated in, inside this venue are well correct. Because those first, you know, two, three days we weren't finding, you know, live victims, they had this concern that you know, we were going to allow their family members to pass. And this is kind of that conversation I had with quite a few. Exacerbating the tensions, the room was too small. They needed a larger venue to contain all the sorrow. So the families were moved one more time, just a little bit further from their loved ones, to a briefing center at the Seaview Hotel in the neighboring city of Bal Harbor. Upstairs, down a long hallway, Stoyloff took over a suite of rooms, setting up a makeshift lab so the human remains could be quickly tested. I had rapid, five rapid DNA instruments, I had the medical examiner, investigators, I had real-time crime center, I had my fingerprints folks. As Stoyloff grew closer to the families, there was an added burden. Since she ran the lab, she was the first to know who was found. I think our effort and the reason it was important to me to be here every day, twice a day, is because I knew we were at least be able to bring the families closure. Um, but that doesn't make it easy. One of my uh, coworkers, his, uh, his brother, um, was, a, was a victim. Um, I sat in on that, on his, the notification for his family, and it was, I mean, it, it just breaks your heart. You know, these, these families, what they went through. Um, and we'll go through forever. I mean, it's not like you get, get over it. One family member asked to, to find out more information about the condition of their loved ones. Mm -hmm. I reached out to the medical examiner's office and they were able to give him the information. He held my hand and Maggie's hand while, while he was on the phone. Um, he just wanted to know, for, you know, just to know. When you say the condition, what do you mean by it? 
the condition of the body. And he was able to get that information, and, and that, I think that was good for him because he needed that for his closure. Families continued to hope for a miracle. From my point of view, it was, hey, I've got the one girl who can come out of that alive. Why do you say that? She was a scrapper, a fighter. You know, if anybody could have found a cubby hole or whatever, and, or which didn't exist, uh, it would have been her. I had moments throughout this, those 18 days where I was roller coastering. There were moments that I was like, there's, there's no way that, you know, that anybody could be alive under that rubble. And there were other moments that I was like, there's someone under there. They're going to find someone. It, you know, it's going to be my mom. We're not giving up. While we understood that the odds were severely, severely against us, we were, of course, still holding out hope. And I think that that's something that everyone, all of the families, at least should have, should have been doing, is holding out hope. I would have been really happy if it was any of the 98 people that did not make it because everybody in this was so innocent. The only thing that my mom is guilty of is going to, uh, to bed, in her bed, in her home, that we all traveled to, that we all spent time and we were, I was there with my kids and my husband days before this. Yeah. What are we doing? We're putting our heads together. Thumbs up? Yeah. My daughter spent a lot of time there. As Rachel talks, her four-year-old daughter, Scarlett, ran around the room playing, just as she used to do in her grandmother's Surfside apartment. Hooray! Were there moments during those briefings, you know, that you remember that, that may have taken your breath a little bit in terms of what you were being told? The detail that comes to my mind is when they said that they hadn't found a space larger than eight inches. And it's like, how do you rescue someone from that type of space? I mean, that's hard. I mean, it's hard to hear. It's hard to hear. The wording I remember is that through all of the days, they were, we, they were looking for voids, 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 voids. And even toward the end, one of the last um, briefings that we went to, I remember they said they have, it's the first time they not found a single void. And we've always promised to be honest with you and we're being honest with you now and we are trying. But the reality is that the spaces that we were hoping were there just have not been there. We understand your frustration. We understand your sorrow. We are trying, but it's just not there right now. We have not been able to find it, not because we're not looking, just because it's just not there. That's the only hope you have, is that some of the structure is going to brace itself and create a void for someone to be able to survive through. And that, that not being found at all is Heartbreaking. unbelievable. I'm not, you know, trying to upset anyone, but we look for what is called, you know, wet area. Maybe blood, you know, maybe, you know, other things. This is where the, uh, the delay has been for us. What's been happening is, as you see, as we continue to dig, it rains. It washes the blood, it washes the fluid. So what usually guides us 99% of the time to those locations, as we dig, it rains. As it dig, we rains. You said one of the things that we do is we look for stains. Wet spots. Wet spots. With blood or bodily fluid. How do you explain to loved ones that you're not finding, you know, their, their loved ones, you know, some of their loved ones intact? Do you remember their reaction? You could just see either A, their eyes just, you know, got enlarged or half the crowd you know, sunk their faces in their hands, or some of them started to, you know, quietly cry. Um, these are these are sights and emotions that you will never be able to, you know, forget. Yes, I remember that. Yeah. Yep, vividly. We needed to hear it because that was what they were working on, but I think that that also made it a little bit more real in the sense that there's a lot of obstacles against us in this situation.
Once he said blood, there were people around that would be like, like downtrodden about that. Got worse to me when he said bodily fluids. But to me, those uh, words were even more devastating. I just think that's another one of the moments where that's, it's just you watch it settle in over the, over the families. Row number three, the woman that put her hand over her mouth and, and put her hand on her husband's leg like, oh my God, this is not good. These are the things that stick with you forever. There's no way that a brain can fathom what was out there, could picture it, could imagine it. Every time we had to give them a news like that, the reason we're having difficulty is because every time we look for blood stains, the rain washes it away. That's like, they're like, what? You're looking for what? Because in their minds, they're picturing their family members intact. And that wasn't the case anymore for a lot of people. So giving them that news, they just sank. Like, Whoa. Well, there was a further element. Even with the rain, there was this constant cloud of the pulverized concrete in the air. The thing that he explained that was really sort of terrifying to me was that the rain with the pulverized uh, concrete dust then created a liquid not dissimilar to lye, and that that then ran down in the cracks and the crevices, could in fact deteriorate you know, flesh, bones, hair, any remains. So I was, you know, thinking, oh my God, and she's been eaten up by that combination. Some family members by day six, seven, eight, were asking questions about the identification process. Other family members were, I remember saying, I don't, why are we talking about the dead? We should be focused on the living. And, and arguments started breaking out. And, and you literally stand there and say, don't yell at each other, yell at me. Yell at me. Why? Why did you do that? I needed them to gauge all their anger at me. Again, there's, they're looking for someone to gauge their anger because, uh, you know, a building has collapsed, numerous family members are deceased, and they just don't know why. And at the end of the day, some had already, you know, acknowledged that their, their loved ones are deceased, while others had not. But at some point, and it may have been a week into it, where family members... They started to transition. Yeah, they started to exchange phone numbers, and we saw it here. They were holding each other. They were making sure, like, you would have a family member that was already notified their, their loved one was found, and they didn't leave. They stayed until that friend that they sat next to, you know, over the course of time, you know, had, you know, some form of closure themselves. And then together they left. And I, almost every single family even apologized at some point for being angry. But there's no nothing to apologize for. It was just raw emotion. It was a safe place to vent that anger. Did people tend to sit in the same place? Yes. Some yes. So if you were looking around, you would know over here yes. we would usually see this person yeah. or like even now today like as you as mm -hmm. you look around you know where I know who I see standing right there I know who sat always 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 in the first two rows yep and you know there was even actually one I won't say argument more of a discussion that you're sitting in my chair yeah. you know discussion yeah um, you know so yes absolutely uh, and 100% you do that type of you know, familiarization with the family members. I could still tell you where everybody sat. Front row on this side, it was um, grandparents and then a, a, a mother whose daughter was missing and she was convinced that her daughter was healthy and alive. So I close my eyes, I can see them. I, I remember seeing the fathers that were really upset, always in the front against the wall. Uh, another uh, elderly in the second row spoke Spanish, or people turned Spanish, crying. Um, all holding hands in, in rows. The room played another role on Fridays. Since many of the people missing were Jewish, families began holding Shabbat services every Friday. You know, I even joined them for my first Sabbath here. In this room. You know, at the end of the day, you know, religions shouldn't, you know, separate, you know, people.
he stood with with us and he uh, was uh, very we felt as one we felt that he is part of the group and only this was the first time that we we talked about his roots your family is Palestinian yes before Jadallah was born his parents immigrated to the United States from Ramallah a city in the West Bank often beset with clashes between Palestinians and Israeli soldiers I would say that uh, 85 percent of those that were um, involved had Jewish background, you know, Jewish faith, Jewish religion. And you see a last name of Jadala, there's going to be questions. And it kind of, you know, uh, played up to the, the trust issue the first few days. Um, and I was even asked, you know, about my upbringing, my beliefs, and even some of the family members even, you know, you know told me that they actually looked me up, did background searches. My background, my practicing as a Muslim, my religion being Islamic had no bearing to this because as I explained to them, you know, it's, it's my community, my family members, three million residents in Dade County are my family members. And at the end of the day, I treated every one of those individuals, every family member, every person, regardless of where they came from, as if they were my family. And they saw it. Lisa Shrem is a rabbi. And she asked Jadala about his last name. And I said, your name, Jadala. Yad Allah. Yad in Hebrew is hand, in Arabic, Eid. Eid Allah. I said, hand of God? He says, yes. I said, uh, and that's great, because if the hand of God is on you, and you're the one looking out for us and our loved ones, then we're in good hands. I said, are you practicing Muslim? He said, yes. To stand next to Israeli soldiers, I didn't know how well that would play with his family, if he had any family still in Ramallah. I think it's, of all the things from here to come out good, that's really one big one. In this kind of incidents, everything is exposed. You see everything. Through the eyes, through the faces. You see the, the hearts. You cannot pretend that you are someone else. And it doesn't matter if you're a Muslim or, or you are Jewish. You see a man's heart in these incidents, in those moments, and we share the same values. It doesn't matter your religion or where you're from. I didn't have a lot of knowledge of the Jewish faith, and I just said, you know what? I'd ask people, is it okay if I, if I hug you? Because I know sometimes it's not okay. And they'd be like, you know what? Yes, I need, I need a hug. Jadala was also dealing with false or misleading information being spread on social media. At least two to three hours out of my day was dealing with misinformation. And we needed to make sure that, you know, the families understood that everything was being done for them. People were, they were getting phone calls, oh, they found your family member, the family would fall apart and then find out, no, it wasn't, and then be happy again. So we told them, any information that doesn't come from in this room is not real. Families were also desperate to visit the site so they could judge for themselves if enough was being done. I'm telling you, Jim, that was the turning point. You may see a victim. You may see human remains. You may see some horrible items. If you want to scream, you want to yell, you want to cry, you want to point your anger at us, do so. But do not try to jump over the balcony. Do not try to exit the hotel to go to the work site. Please, you're, you're, you're going to ruin it for everyone else. Under a police escort, the buses would travel the short route from the hotel to the collapse site. A special viewing area was cordoned off for the families on the patio of the building just north of the Champlain Towers. When they arrived, Lisa Schrem and Rachel Sabag scanned the pile. And it just looked like 9-11. You saw it. There was about 200 men and women working on the hill. But their eyes were drawn to a corner of the building still standing and they could see what remained of Estelle's apartment, her blue and purple suitcases readily apparent against a gray backdrop. It was a little bit overwhelming. Her couch still had the pillows on the, on the couch. The cushions were still on her couch, but just that bedroom part tipped off. That was hard to see. Her apartment's there. The valance of her curtain is, is blowing in the wind. Her 
two suitcases are on the edge of the, the, the ledge of where her apartment was. 30 feet left or right, that's, that's the essence of life. That's it. That's, that's all God's got for us. 30 feet left or right decides whether you live or die. And then when the family members started to scream out the names of their loved ones, <laughs> It was so painful, so painful. It was a point where I screamed out, you know, I used to call Estella, like streetcar named Desire. And uh, it, was, it was really hard because you could feel the anguish in the family members. I can't tell you how many of them just fell to the ground and just cried because they saw with their own eyes what we were up against. We would be in the room and they would ask us, well, have you checked in apartment X? And we would try to explain that there was no apartment X. And after going to the site, when I remember when I left there saying, if there's just two survivors, I'll be happy. Even if, you know, it would be great if it was Estelle, but anybody, just anybody out of there to come out alive would be a miracle. Because we saw, we were 20 feet away from it. We saw just how bad and how much the building crumbled. It made everybody, in a sense, understand that we couldn't just be against the rescue people, but we also had to be with them. We also had to support them and, and, and just try and spur them on as well to keep going. We were, and that's when people started to become more grateful. Watching what happened to them when they went to the site, that to me was one of the hardest days to watch what happened to them. There was families that would just come up to you and just hug you and cry. And, it happened to me several times. I just cried right with them. Um, there was no way not to. It was, you know, when, when you have a family member come up to you and say, thank you, thank you for everything, thank you for telling me all the information, thank you for everything you're doing, please go find my grandchildren. I, I think about it and I still get goosebumps. It's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to know that you're, you don't have good news to tell them that you're going to come back tomorrow and the news isn't going to change. But they need you. They need you there. So it's, it weighs on you. It's, it's like, a, like a weight that you're carrying along with you every day. But I feel that as families, when processing their, their grief and their moments, I was able to process it with them. I, I witnessed it and I was there with them and I, I feel like every time a family member would come up to me and just hold me and say, they found my sister today, they found my mom today, I felt a sense of relief with them. But those bonds that form also come with a price. Jim, it takes a toll, you know, the constant despair and discussion with family members of death, it's, it's not healthy. It's not healthy for the individual that needs to present it, and obviously it's not healthy for the people that are, you know, constantly hearing it. You prepare yourself to come, face the family, all right, this is what we have to talk about today, and you're like, oh, okay, um, that's going to be tough. Um, watching them go through all their phases, you'd have a family and, and some were starting to accept things and others were still angry and some were just sad, and that's just within one family. They worked 15 to 18 hours a day, seven days a week checking on each other for support. I, I had to make sure she was, you know, um, doing well because I, I couldn't afford to lose her. Were there moments you were worried about him? Oh, yeah. There was, I mean, I could see the toll that it was taking on him emotionally. There was times where, you know, he, he'd said to me, here, he was like, thank you for not crying because if you would have started crying, I wouldn't have been able to keep it together. And I think the same thing about him, like, I think even unspoken, we, we found strength in each other's moments of strength when the other one might not have been feeling quite as strong because it happens that way. Not everybody's strong at the same time and not everybody is weak at the same time, luckily. Talk to me about uh, the, the effect on your family. Well, I'm very lucky that my family is extremely supportive. You know, my wife was here for a part of the time. She's an engineer on the team and she saw what I was going through and she was there and she 
she knew we were bringing the families to the to the site, and she, even though it was her time to rest, it was her time to to get some sleep because our team was working overnight from midnight till noon. She waited and she sat in the corner and waited for the families to leave to just be there for me. So she totally understood what was going on. My son's a firefighter. Um, he completely understood and he would text me every day, send me pictures of my grandkids and say, hey, you know, the kids say hi, the kids are doing this. Just anything to try to help me have a, moments that were happy, moments that I could kind of like stop thinking about what I was doing here and just kind of get away from it for a little bit. You know, I was coming home late, you know, close to midnight. Uh, the wife would be, you know, waiting. Uh, I would have a couple of bites at the counter. I wouldn't even sit at the table. Kind of just, you know, briefed her as to what was going on. And she's going to find out, you know, during this interview that, you know, I didn't tell her everything. It's one of those things you just cannot or I didn't feel comfortable just sharing everything because I did not want her to always worry. Do you break down at all? Every night on the way home. Is that the place where you allowed yourself to do that? In the stairwell a couple times here. Um, but either I would either call my mom on the way home or call my husband. What did you tell your mother? when? Like, give me an idea of what you would tell her as you were driving home. Just how hard it was. It was um, how hard it was to talk to the families and tell them that their family members weren't in the condition they were hoping. Um, just that they, there is, yeah, there's no words for it. It's, I wish I could, I, I don't have a, um, there's just no way to explain it. Are reporting that there were some concerns overnight about the remaining part of the structure potentially toppling. That brought a halt to the search and rescue and actually ordered an evacuation. Good morning, Gail. We're not seeing cranes by this building this morning. There are reports that search and rescue operations might have been paused overnight over safety concerns from that building. I started well, thinking, my God. I had for three days my men and women underneath that building, you know, tunneling to get to a certain part of the building, hoping that we could find victims. And now I find out that the only thing that was holding up this building was the debris pile. It just put everything in perspective. I could have lost 30 men and women like that, not even realizing it. Jadala broke the news to the families. We stopped working at 2.13. We have not been able to resume except for it would take them 14 hours to come up with a plan to continue safely searching. We have uh, demolition experts that are going to break down the building in a controlled fashion. On July 4th, a demolition team brought down the remaining structure. With the building gone, it allowed rescue teams an opportunity to get into sections of the debris they hadn't been able to reach. The Israelis created extensive maps of the site, documenting where bodies were found. But by July 7th, 13 days after the collapse, the rescue crews were all in agreement. No one could still be alive. It, it wasn't a shock. By the time that July 7th came, we had that... Uh, uh, again, the probably, well, not probably the most difficult, you know, um, information I had to share with people. Definitely. Um, that I was actually expecting a lot worse in regards to emotions. I would say already 70 or 80 percent of the family members had already accepted reality prior to July 7th. All right. For almost two weeks now, I've been here giving you guys, you know, truth and transparency, and nothing changes. Once we haven't had a hit, an alert, by a dog or the sound devices since the early initiative hours of the uh, search and rescue. This literally makes no voids available for sustainability for uh, life. As such, with all the evidence from all the professionals, all the rescuers, um, including the Israeli team, FEMA, USAR, it has been determined that we are going to transition from search and rescue 
to search and recovery this evening. Our, our sole responsibility at this point is to bring closure, to find your family members, our family members, back to you. I ask you all to look in my eyes. As I promise you, we did everything. No effort was saved, nothing. I know that for some of you, the word recovery is a bit frightening. You don't have to be frightened. We are here with you today. We will keep on and be with you in the next days, as much as and as long as we need. And again, we don't even try to imagine how we feel right now. Thank you. The news there was no hope of anyone still being alive reverberated beyond the room and sent the community into mourning. A procession of priests and nuns from nearby St. Joseph's Church walked to the collapse site to pray for those now assumed dead. While on the pile, a new phase began, with specially trained dogs brought in to focus solely on the search for human remains. As the dogs do their work, the pace of bodies being recovered noticeably quickens. On day 18, Mike Stratton was sitting in the room waiting for the next briefing to begin when a Miami-Dade detective pulled him aside. You know, there was a, a reasonable chance that people were so pulverized that they might not have ever found everybody or enough remains. So at that point, I was thrilled that we, they found her and that we could uh, come to terms about that with our family. That same day, Judy Spiegel's remains were also identified. Rachel received the call from the detective. I, I don't know if the, the word is relief, but we were so happy that she was found, period, because one of our fears was that they wouldn't be able to find her at all. Judy Spiegel was identified through Rachel's DNA sample, Cassie Stratton through fingerprints. They recovered off of her a uh, Cartier love bracelet that she wore every day, every day for the many years that I'd given it to her. And I have that, and it's uh, it, it's still sort of oval in shape, but very smashed down. Um, so they had to have taken that off of her arm. It's only been fairly recently that I don't, you know, break down when I see somebody that I had, or she and I had a, a friendship with, or an emotional tie. So, yeah, I broke down a lot. Hello. Hello. Today it's your birthday. Jump right in. I feel terrible for my daughters that ha had a strong bond with my mom that will never, you know, they'll never get to experience more birthdays, more celebrations. You know, my birthday is coming up. I'm scared, you know. I feel for Josh, who has never been married, and, you know, my mom won't be able to, you know, walk him, you know. Like those kind of things that, you know, no child should ever have to experience. And one of the things, you know, Scarlett was asking me a lot of questions today. I don't know if she's overheard me over the car course of the past few weeks um, or if she's just made up scenarios in her mind of what happened because she's asked me everything from did a, gr a dragon get grandma and even today, she asked me if the building fell on grandma. But one of the things she asked me, which I thought was remarkable for a four-year-old, is she asked me, grandma was not the only person that lived in the building. What happened with everybody else? And, and at that point, I explained to her that there were 98 people that were impacted by the building being unsafe. And, and now we're doing everything in our power to make sure that no other building is unsafe. She thought that 98 was a tremendous number, and it is. Once the operation moved to the recovery phase, the Israeli team made plans to return home. Before they left, they had one final Shabbat dinner together. Appreciate you both very, very much. Then the two IDF commanders surprised Jadala. 
placing colonel stripes on his collar. I can probably uh, determine that uh, Chief Jardala is the fastest colonel in the history of the idea. <laughs> God bless him, man. I, he caught me off guard when he did that. Uh, you know, even till today, I'm um, extremely humbled by the gesture of him knowing my, you know, Palestinian background had no bearing to it. It's just the two individuals who came together to make sure the community, our families, the members that were, you know, grieving were handled in the most utmost professional and, and respectful and, and with dignity. We suffered together. We shed tears together. We, we didn't try to maintain, you know, like, um, like a cold professionals that standing in front, of, in front of the families and they don't feel nothing. We, we felt their pain and we had our tears and our uh, uh, pain also. Every day that followed, more remains were found and identified. Some days it would be one or two names released, other days it might be four or five. That slow drip of sorrow that we were bringing them was devastating to the point that recovering family members was the good news, which was really tragic and surreal. That Confirming that their loved yes, one was dead. Yes, as the family members sat and they watched one by one a group of family members were told and they're no longer in the room and it's dwindling and they didn't want to be the last one to know. As the room cleared out, Lisa and Rachel were left to wonder if their friend Estelle would ever be found. Happy Dear Stella, happy I just felt like obligated to be here as a friend and as a person that was in her life and she meant a lot to me. On July 20th, a bone from Estelle Hidea's forearm was located in a pile of rubble that had been relocated to a field where investigators are hoping to understand why the building collapsed. A few days later, DNA confirmed the bone belonged to Estelle. She was the 98th and last victim identified. It wasn't a sad moment for me. It was actually happy, which I still feel very guilty about. You know, I knew the inevitable, uh, but to know that they recovered something that we could bury to give closure to her family and to, to us, really, for God's sakes, we were in such limbo for so long. How do you think this has all affected you? Uh, ask my husband. <laughs> um, it's been difficult. So, yeah, I, no, I don't think I've processed it yet. I think, um, I don't think you, I think you find your way through it, but I don't think you get over it. There's no way for anybody to have gone through this, whether you're a family member or somebody that was a first responder or part of this whole effort that came out, nobody came out unscathed. It'll never leave you, like, suicide, for the rest of your life, for everybody who was involved, from the families to first responders, everybody who was there, you're gonna take a piece of that with you for the rest of your life. And whenever you come here, at least for me, like we, we just went by the site right now, and there isn't a moment that, that doesn't go by that we say, wow, you remember this, you remember that, you know, it's just ghostly. The beautiful sky, the beautiful beach, beautiful buildings, and one of the worst things that's ever happened in Miami-Dade County happened right there. I never imagined that the thing I came to do that one afternoon would turn into something that has changed my life. I'd I never imagined becoming so close with so many people and just being a part of so many people's journey and them being a part of mine. I hope to God that they know that, you know, that we brought some sort of respect and, and dignity to the family members when we, you know, uh, that were deceased when we found them. In a way, it's a little comforting because we know that we brought everyone home and everyone that was in this room got their closure and got their family member back.
Watch CBS4 News tonight at 11. Stories that connect us all.